Okay, you've made it. And hopefully you're not too wet. I hope you're enjoying the program. We're about to start our second plenary session, um, which is also the Dale Mortensen Memorial Lecture. I don't need to tell this crowd what an amazing scholar and a wonderful human being Dale was. I was a uh, colleague of his at the beginning of my career at Northwestern for six years. But more importantly, I see him every day because his portrait hangs on a wall right outside of my office at Carnegie Mellon on our Nobel laureate line. So when I return, I will let him know that his legacy is stronger than ever, given the number of papers Marla and I had to process that were on labor search and matching and wage dynamics. So enjoy the plenary, and I will hand the podium over to Issa Lindenthal, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. I am very happy and honored to introduce my advisor, co-author, and friend Jan Eckhout for his plenary talk tonight. Jan is professor of economics at Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona, which is also where he started his career about two decades ago. Between leaving Barcelona and coming back to Barcelona, he spent about 10 years at UPenn, where he was a tenured professor, and for the last eight years, he split his time between Pompeo and UCL in London. I am actually an unlikely student of Jan. I met him by total coincidence not long after he left UPenn for Barcelona at some lecture series he gave. I wasn't a student at Pompeo at the time, so he had really no obligation towards me, yet he sort of adopted me as his student, and ever since I tremendously benefited from his support and also from his curiosity and enthusiasm for research, and I'm very grateful for that. His curiosity and enthusiasm for research is also reflected in his own work, which is broad in terms of topics and ranges from theoretical and applied work. Jan is a prolific researcher, and he has made a lot of significant contributions to several areas, where we'll focus here on maybe the main three of them, which I identified as matching, urban economics, and market power, even though, as I'm saying, market power, I realize it's not quite yet a field, but maybe we're getting there. Jan is one of the leading scholars in the field of matching. He has made numerous contributions, actually too many to list them here, analyzing the sorting of heterogeneous agents and its implication in several empirically relevant environments, and also studying the identification of sorting in the data. Jan also contributed to urban and spatial economics, where he has analyzed the important topics of understanding the size distribution of cities, and also by applying creatively the tools of sorting to this field, um, how differently skilled workers sort across cities of different sizes. Finally, and most recently, Jan embraced an, an, an an entirely new topic, market power, and significantly contributed to reviving the debate that surrounds it. He documented a remarkable increase in economy-wide markups over time, both in the US and then also globally. Now, all the devils are in the details of measurement here, and his finding on the large increase of market power has triggered a heated, but I also think useful, debate in the profession. I'm now taking the liberty to sort of summarize this um, debate about measurement in a funny way, combining market power and the tools of sorting, which is all about cross partials. And the question essentially was whether the cross partial derivative of market power with respect to, say, market concentration and the Jan's measurement methods is positive or not. So Jan and his co-authors have done a lot to convince us that this object is actually um, zero, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this either in today's talk or in the future. So please join me in welcoming Jan Eckhardt for his plenary talk. I didn't see that one coming, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, thank you, Ilse, for the kind introduction. I, I've, we've known each other for nine years, I think it is. Um, I learned a lot of economics from Ilse. She's uh, one of the people I admire most in the profession. And on top of it, she's a, a fabulous friend. I also want to thank the Society for the invitation to give the Dale Mortensen lecture. It's a, a great honor. I would like to introduce the lecture with uh, the following uh, observation. Corporate profits, especially for large firms, uh, have been, are now higher than they have ever been. Okay? If you look at the, the share of sales for the publicly traded firms, on average it's about 7%, the profit share, and it was around 1% in the early 80s. And as I said, this is especially true for the large firms. And I would like to ask today, can we learn something about the change in market power to help explain this? And can we understand the economic mechanisms behind it, this? So this is my objective for today. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you some facts, a summary of the uh, facts and the rise of market, and the relationship between markets and profits and market power in general. And then what I would like to do is propose a model a theory that helps us understand both the causes and the consequences of uh, markups and market power. And when I think of the causes, I think of two channels. The first channel is technological. And when I think of technology, I'd like to you know, put the idea of uh, Amazon in, in, in your head. And I want to think of the Amazon paradox, as I'm going to call it. And why is it a paradox? Because Amazon uh, is delivering, for example, this pointer at a low price to your doorstep, and we love it for that. But at the same time, the reason why Amazon can do this is because it's so productive, so uh, efficient in you know, setting up a network uh, of, of delivery and uh, logistics. And that helps Amazon get a large market share, which at the same time drives out competitors. So while it delivers this good at a low price, it also creates, at the same time, market power. And the consequence of that, and that's why I think it's a paradox, is that the low price that you buy this good at is actually not low enough. It could be lower because there's not enough competition that Amazon faces, because it's so much more productive than any of the other firms. And I'm going to try and use this as a way to model the technological change. The second channel is market structure, and this is you know, directly the number of competitors that you face. I want you to think there uh, of the company ABM Bev. ABM Bev is the largest producer and distributor of beer, and it's a company that over time, starting in Europe uh, with uh, Interbrew, has, through mergers and acquisitions, grown. Then they merged with uh, the larger beer producer in, in uh, Brazil. Uh, to become uh, InBev, and then finally, in 2006, they bought Anheuser-Busch, the beer producer here in downtown uh, St. Louis. And then, since then, they've also acquired further uh, Miller, and now they have 35% of world sales in beer. In the United States, they have 65%. In some markets in the world, they have 90%. What that means is you go to a bar, you see... 17 options for different beers on tap, but they're all from the same producers. Okay? You have options of choice, but not competition between producers of beer. And this has led to market power, and AB InBev is a different example of how market power arises because of this market structure compared to how Amazon, through organic growth, has generated market power. Now, once we have this in a model, and I'm going to look at a general equilibrium model with uh, oligopolistic markets uh, and, and ba basically competitive input markets, we're going to look at what the consequences are of this rise in market power. And for the consequences, I want to really focus on a number of secular trends that we have observed uh, in the data and that many people here have worked on. And the most important one is the decline in business dynamism, the fact that firms turn over labor uh, much slower than they used to, I could say this is something that has, uh, John Haltiwanger has, been, been, uh, has discovered at least 15 years ago and has been talking about uh, for, for since then. Related to that is also the decline in, in startups. The second consequence is what I'm going to call wage stagnation, the fact that real wages have been constant and as a result wages as a share of GDP have been declining. The third secular trend is the substantial decline in the aggregate labor share. And I'm going to uh, also relate this to the rise in markups. And finally, there's this notion of the rise of superstar firms, reallocation of sales from small, low-market firms to large, high-market firms. 
Now, of course, causes and consequences in a general equilibrium model are determined simultaneously. I'm just separating the causes because these are levers that we're going to be able to push or pull, if you want, depending on what changes in the model, and we're going to quantify that model. Now, I should say this is all based on uh, joint work, and in fact, I'm going to talk about several papers here. I'm going to give an overview of uh, uh, the literature with Jan, Simon, Hector, and Gabriel, and we've had the collaboration of uh, students at the UPF, Shabdeep Way, and uh, Asim. Without them, there would have been nothing here. So. so let me start with the facts. As I said, my first objective is to give you a, a brief overview of the facts. The first uh, thing I want to say is, with Jan de Luker, we started to use a cost-based method, which is based on a method by Bob Hall from 1988, and that allows us to basically, with less data requirements, derive markups for individual firms. And we have an individual firm markup just defined in the standard way, the price over the marginal cost. And this gives us, therefore, a distribution of the sample of firms that we have in our data. We're going to do this for publicly traded firms because of data availability. And this is going to be an important caveat of what I say here today. This is most of the facts I'm showing is only for publicly traded firms. The advantage is that we have a broad cross-section of you know, for different sectors and also a long time series from 1955 to 2016. I should say that there's a distinction to be made between markups and market power, in the sense that markups take into account basically the price over the marginal cost, basically a notion of how much a variable input uh, cost and what the relation is to the price. But market power should also take into account fixed cost. And I'm going to come back to the importance of fixed cost and, in fact, more precisely, the technological change that's been going on in terms of the fixed cost that we observe. So let me start with the first fact, which is there's a heterogeneity in markups in this distribution, and over time there's heterogeneity that is importantly going to contribute to what we see is the distribution of markups. But one thing before we even start is that the median is fairly flat. Okay? There's not much of a change in the median markup. When I look at the sales-weighted market, and I'm going to come back to the input-weighted markups that many of you here uh, uh, would prefer, we see kind of an inverted U-shaped pattern until 1980, and then from 1980 we see a fairly sharp rise for two decades, flat for the first decade of the 21st century, and then again starting to rise. What I'm going to show you next is a figure just like this one, and I'm only going to uh, blow up the vertical axis because then I, would, I want to put the 90th percentile up there. And so what you see is this is still the same solid line with the sales weighted average, but now we have this uh, uh, rise, if you want, in the 90th percentile. And in a sense, what I want to show with this is that the rise of markups is mainly driven by the tail. You can see this here as well. This is you know, I take the 1980 distribution in dashed line, in the dashed line, and the solid line is the 2016. Uh, this is the kernel density of this distribution across all firms. And what we see is that, you know, as you kind of can imagine from uh, the, the, the plot with the median, there's not much of a change in the median or the mode. There's a change in the tail, both the left tail, by the way, and the right tail. But it's the 90th percentile here that's driving, you know, or the upper tail that's driving the rise in this average market. So my first point is heterogeneity is, first of all, important, and second, it's changing. You know, the, the market distribution becomes more heterogeneous, and it's all a lot of the action going on in the tails. There's basically a rise for uh, a few firms, but for most firms, there's no change whatsoever, and that's important. In fact, already a year ago, I talked about this with uh, Jim Bullard. I don't know whether Jim is here, but, and he said, you know, I go around my... Federal Reserve District here in St. Louis, and I talk to business leaders, and all of them tell me that business situation or business kind of the competition is actually harsher than ever. I think that's consistent with what I'm saying, because if you're one of these most firms, you haven't seen an increase in market power. Okay? In fact, you probably suffer from an Amazon or an ABMF if you're a small brewer. But of course, there's a few of these people that when you meet them, they're going to report very nice profits and high uh, markups. And in fact, the CEO of AB InBev, of Anheuser-Busch, is Carlos Brito, is a Brazilian uh, uh, businessman. It's probably unlikely that Jim met him because headquarters are in Belgium. It's a large firm. After the many mergers, they've ended up you know, with a behemoth kind of firm that isn't located in St. Louis anymore. At least headquarters isn't located in St. Louis anymore. You wonder why these guys, you know, with Brazilian management, headquarters in Belgium, 
And selling American beers, they could do even better. They could sell Belgian beers, have headquarters in Brazil, and have American <laughs> management. <laughs> um, good. Second fact. Second fact has to do with reallocation. And to do that, I want to show basically the difference between the markup weighted by sales and average and the market weighted by total cost. Okay, this is a point that has been made initially by uh, Basil Grassi in a 2016 paper and later on by a, a paper by Edmund Middergren and Zhu, that how you weigh markups is important. And in fact, you see two things. First of all, I should say this is weighted by total cost. What uh, 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 these authors propose is that you should actually weight it only by variable cost. And I'm going to show you that one uh, in, in a bit. But we, I want you to look at two things. First of all, you see that this markup is always lower, okay? but more importantly, the gap between the two increases over time. And why is that? It's really the case that you know, if you're a firm that has market power, what you do is you sell at a high price, and the reason why you do it is because you increase your sales. But if you increase your sales, you move up the demand curve, and therefore you lower the quantity that, you've, uh, that you're selling, and therefore you lower the quantity of inputs or the value of inputs that you're using. So there's a decline in inputs, and if you input weigh, okay, with more market power, the difference between output weighing is going to be larger. Now, why do I still use sales weighted and not just input weighted? Because there's a good theoretical reason if you have CES preferences to use input weighting. It's precisely to highlight this difference. Okay? And there's a second reason that I'm going to come back to, which is please don't plug in an input weighted markup uh, average if you have a representative agent economy. But I'm going to come back to that. Now, what is important in terms of this reallocation that's going on? I showed you the distribution of markups with the markup distribution, say, in 1980 and 2016. And there's two reasons why the sales weighted markup could go up. One is because that distribution changes, as you've seen. The second reason is because there's more mass moving from the low market firms to the high market firms. Basically, the weight is changing. And this is measured in a decomposition, an Oli Pekis type decomposition, where this is the change in the distribution itself. And this black term would be the change in the market share. The cross term has, is actually zero in the date, and we need it for accounting. And then there's a third term, which is the net entry term. Okay, because there's also firms that leave the, the sample and other firms that enter. In particular, we have firms that leave the sample because of mergers and acquisitions. So when I plot the cumulative change in these three components, what I get is the following. We see the total, this is the red line, the total markup. Okay, it can be decomposed in these three terms. They sum up to the red line. And what we see is that the change due to the distribution itself, what is called the within uh, change, is actually initially about a third, then it levels out, and then it even declines. So the rise in average markup, sales weighted markups, is not really due predominantly due to the change in the distribution. It's due predominantly due to the second term, which is that there's more business going from small firms to large firms, from low market firms to high market firms. Okay? And so you get an ABM BEV that's getting a really, really large share of sales, and it's a firm with high markups. And that's why we see this sharp rise uh, in the market distribution. The third line, the green line, is the one from net entry, and it also is related to EAB InBev, because in 2006, when there was two firms, there was Anheuser-Busch and there was InBev, okay, we had a certain average markup for those, these two firms, sorry, the, the average over these two firms, and then in 2007, there's a new firm that appears in our data, EAB InBev. Okay? Given that this green line is positive, it says that because of these mergers, the merged companies have higher markups on average than the pre-merger two companies. Okay, so this is indicating that in this net entry term, you know, there's actually a rise in markups. It could have been negative. Now, this reallocation, the fact that it's driven by in two-thirds of the change by this change in the market share is, co is consistent with this notion of the superstar firm. This is the idea that uh, author and co-authors have uh, uh, proposed as an explanation for the, the rise, uh, sorry, the decline in the labor share, that there's basically large firms out there much more, uh, uh, much larger now than they used to be. What we add to that is in addition, of course, these are the firms with the high markups. So reallocation of sales from low to high markups accounts for about two thirds of the rise in the sales weighted uh, 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 markup 
uh, average marker. The third fact has to do with changes in technology. This is the overhead cost. In accounting terms, this is called SGNA, and the SGNA has basically, as a share of total cost, gone up in 1980 from around 15% to around 21%. And it's that technological change that I believe is going to be important also when we're going to try and explain this Amazon paradox. Amazon is investing enormous amounts in a distribution network, and this allows it to deliver this object at a very low marginal cost. And at the same time, of course, it's going to affect the market power vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis its, its competitors. Now, what you see is that if you look at the markup and the effect of markups, of, this is a simple regression of uh, markups on, on this fixed cost, there's a positive relationship. Now, it could be that you know, if fixed costs have gone up, I have to raise my price to even stay uh, to be break-even as a firm. So the fact that you see a positive relationship between the markup and the fixed cost is not surprising. This is at the firm level. What is more surprising is that it is the large firms that have the highest fixed cost. Okay. Moreover, it is the firms with the highest fixed cost that also have the highest profit rates. If it was a competitive market, this coefficient would be zero. Okay. So firms that have heavily invested, like these Amazons, make kind of excess profits. Okay. And that's what uh, this shows. So technology matters. There's a rise in overhead cost that is uh, substantial, and it's uh, in particular the case for large firms. And then the last thing is an, an issue about the magnitude of the increase. The first number I showed you for the sales-weighted markup is an increase of about 40 points, from 1.21 in 1980 to 1.61 in 2016. Now, Bob Hall is the one who first came up with this cost-based method, and this is uh, from his 1988 paper. And there he uses basically this method to estimate markups at the industry level, using CLEMS data, aggregate data. Bob has read on that exercise now for more recent data in his 2018 paper. And what Bob says is, you know, you guys get an increase of about 40 points. If I do this on aggregate data, I get an increase of only 20 points. So we say, let's repeat Bob's exercise, but with our data. So we have here micro data, but let's pool this micro data in one sector and treat this one sector as one firm. And we do this for all the sectors in our uh, uh, model. So basically, in our data. So basically, what we're doing is exactly the same exercise as Bob Hall, but with different data, with micro data. Now, when we do that, and there's three different ways to do it, we can talk about the details. What you see is that you, the increase in markups is much less pronounced than the increase if we do it with micro level data. This is based on exactly the same firms. Okay, the number of firms hasn't changed; it's just the way you aggregate. What this tells us is that aggregation is important. This is really Jensen's inequality kicking in. It's not a linear aggregation. And if you pool firms at the level of an industry, you lose a lot of that heterogeneity that's important for what's driving the uh, weighted uh, markup. So this is telling us that a lot of the heterogeneity is actually within sectors. Okay? And when we do decompositions of these markups, we see that it's also the case within sector. The other kind of difference is that we get a 40-point increase in this markup, but if you look at the profit rate, the profit rate is only increasing from about 0 or 1% to 7 or 8%. How can you square this? You know, how can you square an increase of 40 points with an increase of 7% percentage points, one being the markup, the other one being the profit rate? And in fact, there is an identity. If I look at the firm-level profit rate, which is sales minus total cost over sales, if I rewrite this, this is just 1 minus cost over quantity is average cost. The price, well, the markup is price over marginal cost, so therefore the price is equal to markup times marginal cost. That's what we have here. Now let's do something very simple. Let's plug in our markup from, 19, from 2016, which is 1.61. Okay? And then let's set this for now equal to 1. I'm going to come back to this. Well, the implied profit rate for this markup of 1.6 is going to be 38% of sales. If I would do it in the GDP equivalent of value added, it would be roughly double. It would be nearly 80%. No one believes this. I don't either. What's wrong? What's wrong is that we've used an average here. So we're again running into an aggregation issue. We're again running into Jensen's inequality. 
what happens is that, you know, if you put individual level markups here and then properly aggregate some over all these realizations with the proper weight, then you're going to actually get a very different outcome than plugging in an average. Okay, so we know that Jensen's inequality grades this, uh, 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 this distortion. And the second reason why we get a very high number here is that I said, let me set this average cost over marginal cost equal to one as if that hasn't changed. But that has changed a lot. I showed you earlier that we see a rise in this fixed cost, so the average cost over marginal cost ratio has increased substantially. When we adjust for both this proper aggregation and this change in the average cost over marginal cost ratio, what we see is that you don't get these very large implied profit rates. You actually get profit rates that look very similar. The blue line is where you plug in averages, what you're not supposed to do. And the red line is what we get, the predicted profit rate based on the model. And the pink line is what the data tells us. So we get much closer to what the data says, unlike what you get when you plug in averages and do not adjust for the change in technology. Good, so these are my facts. I have to say, there's one important thing here. This is only for publicly traded firms. It's roughly 40% of GDP. But there could be a lot of selection here. You know, publicly traded firms are very different from non-publicly traded firms, and that by itself could create a lot of uh, selection. Moreover, it seems to be an issue of large firms with superstar firms, so we have to worry about the fact that publicly traded firms are typically larger. We have one robustness check where we do this for the census of manufacturing, so we have the universe of firms in manufacturing, and what we see is a similar pattern. We see an increase in, this is of course every five years, we see an increase in the average markup, the level is a little bit higher and the increase is not as much as not 40 points, but rather 30 points. And we get also this 90th percentile in manufacturing to uh, increase. We also repeated this exercise for a, a data set of publicly traded firms around the world. So this is something similar like to the publicly traded firms in the US, but just a data set for 134 countries with 70,000 firms. We thought this is, must be a pattern that's only in the US. You know, people have talked about the Borg Doctrine changes in antitrust enforcement, and we thought maybe this is just something for the US. We were surprised that not only to find it also in the rest of the world, but also that it looks extremely similar with these two decades of increase, a decade flat, and then uh, rising again. OK, so if these are the facts, let's now think about a model that allows us to think about the causes and the consequences of market power. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a general equilibrium model of market power, and we're going to really build on, uh, uh, on Atkinson and Burstein. What we're going to add to this is one that there's going to be overhead. There's going to be on top of that productivity shock, so we're going to have basically changes in the uh, productivity of firms, and there's going to be heterogene heterogeneity in the productivity. And we're going to have an endogenous market structure because firms are going to decide or not to enter in a market. And we're going to have general equilibrium in the input markets. So the input markets are going to be competitive. The output markets are going to be uh, uh, oligopolistic. But on the input market, now we're going to have a general equilibrium effect in terms of the pricing. And this is going to affect wages. So what is the basic setup? We have J sectors. When we simulate the economy, it's going to be 20,000. We want really to, there to be many sectors. And in each sector, there's going to be a number of potential entrants. This is a, a kind of a, a modeling technique that Steve Barry has introduced when he analyzed uh, the airline market. And it's a way to think of this notion that the market structure is going to be endogenous. So how do you do that? You know, if firms are heterogeneous, then you cannot have a competitive fringe. So basically, because otherwise, you know, there would be enough firms to enter so that you always have the top uh, realization. So by setting a fixed number of firms who potentially compete, they may or may not, depending on the realization of their productivity, you basically control the competitiveness of that market. And we're going to use that here as well. And so then we see a number of actual firms entering compared to the ones that potentially could have uh, entered. Household preferences, as in Atkinson and Burstein, are going to be a nested CS with high substitutability within the sector, so that's Coke and Pepsi, and another market could be BMW and Toyota, but low substitutability between the car and the soft drink market. There's going to be a single input here, labor, no capital. There's going to be a linear technology. We can solve it with a nonlinear technology, but for the moment it doesn't change any of our uh, results. 
And as I said, we have a market structure that is based on uh, uh, Barry's uh, way of modeling this, which is going to be Cournot with entry at a fixed cost. We can do it with differentiated Bertrand. We get also very similar results. So how is the firm's static decision? It's basically you make a random productivity draw. There's a permanent component and a, a, a transitory component. Why do we have dynamics if we have static optimization? Because we really want to look at comparisons over time, even though you statically optimize, um, what happens to the evolution of the market structure over time. So based on your realization, you know that there's a fixed cost. You see everyone else's productivities. You make a decision whether or not to enter into the market. If you have a low realization of marginal cost of productivity, you're not going to enter. If you have a high realization, you're going to uh, of a high realization of productivity, you will uh, enter. And then once you're in the market, you choose employment. And basically the market prices, quantities, and market shares are determined. Now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the equilibrium effect of, on the one hand, technology, I said the first channel, and technology here means really changes in the fixed cost. So what is a fixed cost doing? The higher the fixed cost, the fewer firms enter. Okay. We're also going to look at a change in the variance in these productivity shocks. And you want to really think of this as the Amazon uh, uh, paradox here. Because consider a simple example of Cournot with two identical firms. And let me now do a mean preserving spread. So we start at the firms being identical. They have both equal market shares, equal profits. They have a common price. And so basically we know and, and equal markups. Now what happens as we have a mean preserving spread? The firm that has a higher productivity is going to have a, a higher markup, is going to have higher profits, and it's going to have a higher market share. So if this is the case now, even in the limit, that one firm is be gonna, gonna become really like a monopolist, even though there's two firms. Because if its market share is close to 100%, it's as if it's a monopolist. But that change is not only the profits, but also the average markup. Okay, so you know, by changing the distribution of shocks, you change the markups. And notice there's actually a positive selection effect here because by doing this mean preserving spread, you produce more by this high productivity firm, Amazon again. Okay, these guys, you like the fact that these guys are getting a higher market share because it's good to have low-cost firms producing. But of course, they're going to take some of those rents for themselves because they have market power. The second effect is going to be the equilibrium effect of this market structure parameter, the number of potential entrants. As I change the number of potential entrants, I'm going to have eventually less or more competition, depending on how many firms get a chance to make a draw, uh, or have an opportunity to make a draw uh, of this productivity. So this is your ABM BEF uh, situation. Now, I should say this model has many limitations. There's a quote here by a medical doctor. He was a cancer research pioneer. He's one of the first persons to rediscover uh, chemotherapy treatment against uh, uh, cancer. And they knew that he, he discovered that you don't need to kill all the blood cells. The question is, how much chemo do you have to give to, um, sorry, not the blood cells, the cancer cells, how much chemo do you have to give to really eliminate the cancer without giving too much chemo because it has very uh, negative side effects. And so what Skipper said is that, you know, the way I'm doing this is by modeling this, and people criticize them. And he says, I know my model is bad, it's a lie, okay, but it helps you see the truth. And I have quite a few lies here. So, you know, we don't really have dynamic pricing. Ideally, we would like to do this. Simon, in his job market paper, has a version with dynamic prices, but he can only have two firms. We really want endogenous entry, we don't know how to solve it. The second shortcoming is, ideally, I would like to think of Amazon being the firm that invests, you know, has a big fixed cost investment, and by the size of an investment, it, ter it determines the marginal cost. So the more I invest, the lower my marginal cost is, which is, again, I think what happens with uh, Amazon. This is something that uh, John Sutton has been proposing as an explanation for how market power uh, arises. We are working on ways in which to introduce this in the model, but today I don't have that. We would like to have skill heterogeneity or consumer heterogeneity. That's, you know, we have representative agents in that dimension. And we would like to have oligopsony or monopsony, depending on whether there's one or multiple uh, firms, because firms that have oligopsony power are actually going to not uh, affect just the output prices, but also the input prices. Again, we have a competitive input market, so there's no oligo oligopsony in our model. <laughs> 
And then finally, there's also you know, changes in demand or in globalization that might drive changes in markups. You know, if you cha have changes in the, in the preference uh, side, I've seen a paper this morning by uh, uh, Bornstein that basically analyzes that, and there's also a paper by Jamovich, Ravel, and Wong that, that goes in that direction. Again, you know, we don't have that. We take the demand uh, as given. I think of globalization as a form of technological change, you know, whether you have trade between Luxembourg and France or between Vermont and, uh, and New Hampshire, you know, one is international trade, the other one is not. Okay, and I think you can think of, of uh, globalization as a form of uh, technological change. In fact, to come back to the merger between uh, Anheuser-Busch and, and InBev, I heard a story that when the, the, the uh, management of InBev came to St. Louis to do the due diligence of uh, Anheuser-Busch, they realized that, you know, um, that the, the, the beers that they were selling here, that, that the Budweiser that they were selling was only for the North American market. And what has happened ba basically in the beer market is that beers now are global brands. And InBev said, what we're going to do is we're going to take Budweiser to Shanghai and to Buenos Aires, which wasn't there in 2006. The only thing they were worried about is, you know, did Anheuser-Busch think of it themselves to do that? And after a week here, they realized that they didn't because none of the executives of Anheuser-Busch had actually a passport, so there was no chance that these guys were traveling. <laughs> Good. We quantify that model, okay? How do we do it? We just try to match as few moments as possible. Now, since I've stressed so much that what is changing in the distribution of markups is the distribution, not just, you know, an average, we match two moments, which is the average markup and the uh, uh, 75th percentile. We've also done it with the 90th percentile. We can also target the gross profit rate, the share of labor that's being used for production of overhead and the reallocation rate. Again, you know, this is one of my macro consequences, but we really believe that this is the in integral part of what is driving the labor market connection uh, with, with markups. Now, if you compare the estimates for 1980 and 2016, what we see is that there's a huge drop in the potential entrance. Okay, so there's an, an, an important role for the decline in the competitiveness. Okay, and you can think of this as an ABM BEV situation. There's now basically two or three brewers in the world, and there was many more uh, uh, three, four decades ago. But we also see substantial changes in the estimates of the fixed cost. Okay, we see a more than fourfold increase in the fixed cost. We do see changes in the productivity. Uh, the, sorry, the, the productivity process, but it's kind of offsetting each other in the sense that the transitory process is becoming a bit more volatile, but the permanent process is becoming less, and so therefore it doesn't have much of a, a kind of aggregate effect. But the important thing to look at here is that if you look at the number of entrants, on average, we have nine in 1980, so of course the, the, the realization is stochastic because the productivities are stochastic and there's endogenous entry, but on average there's nine firms in 1980 in each of these markets. By 2016, our model wants there only to be three uh, entrants on average. And so the question is, what happens to welfare? Notice that welfare could have gone up or down because we have this positive selection effect that even if markups go up, it could be that you, know, you produce more with high productivity firms now. Okay, and this could be the positive effect of, um, of having an Amazon. We find that the welfare effect is negative, okay, and it's fairly substantial. Now, how can we decompose that welfare effect? There's a fundamental trade-off here between basically four different forces. We're going to decompose this average welfare change that uh, uh, the, the welfare change that you, you see here, basically in log differences, and. The first negative effect is that if you have average markups going up, what's happening is that you basically generate dead weight loss. So basically with higher prices, that generates dead weight loss, and this is going to have an unambiguous negative effect on welfare. Second, there is this reallocation that I was mentioning, that if you have, say, more productive firms, you move sales, you reallocate sales from low productivity to high productivity firms, that has a positive effect on welfare, because I'm producing with Amazon. Amazon is a, low product, a high productivity firm, so this is going to generate surplus. Okay? That's a positive effect. Selection, you know, if I change, for example, the fixed cost, the higher the fixed cost, the better the type of firms have to be in order to enter. So this is a positive selection effect. Now, of course, 
the higher the profits for a given fixed cost, the worse the firms are going to be that enter because anyone can afford to enter. So you're going to have either a positive or a negative effect depending on whether it's the profits that go up or the uh, fixed cost. And then finally also notice that we have endogenous labor supply. And as there's an effect on the labor force, this is going to be through the general equilibrium, general equilibrium effect on, on labor supply. When we do this decomposition for our uh, estimated economy between 1980 and 2016, so this is in, in log differences, we get a change in the welfare of minus 13 log points. Okay? And that can be decomposed in an effect, a large effect from the change in the average markups. So basically, dead weight loss is enormous. Okay? Because, of course, we see a large increase in these uh, uh, markups. But there is a positive effect from reallocation. So we get this positive effect, productivity effect from Amazon. Amazon generates really a, a, a surplus or positive welfare because it is so efficient. Okay? But of course, Amazon is also extracting some of these rents. So this is, Amazon is also here. It's not only ABM, but also Amazon has higher markups. And then selection is a small negative effect. As I said, it's ambiguous. The negative effect seems to dominate. And we get also a negative effect from the change in the labor supply that basically the households work uh, less than they used to. And this is the decomposition that we get for the different components um, uh, from the, uh, the change in the technology. Now, let me just give you a quick kind of idea of the uh, mechanics of the model. I'm going to do a comparative static by changing the fixed cost. And if I change the fixed cost, the higher the fixed cost, the higher the average markup is in the 75th percentile. The blue dot is what basically the economy is in 1980, and it's as, as I increase the fixed cost, I'm going to see a higher markup. I'm also going to see a higher reallocation rate of labor. What does that mean? Well, if the fixed cost is higher, there's going to be more firms that enter and exit the market, and therefore these firms are going to have a lot of reallocation of labor. Okay? This is not what we see in the data, by the way. In the data, we see declining labor dynamism, so this is not going to help us explain this. The inverted U-shape effect on welfare comes from the fact that, on the one hand, you have selection. On the, one, on the other hand, you have dead weight loss. As I increase the fixed costs, you know, better firms enter. You have relocation to these better firms, but they extract rent from you. Okay? And that's why we get an inverted U-shape effect. And the effect on wages is basically following the effect of uh, welfare. We can do the same thing with the change in the market structure. It looks very similar here. The non-monotonicity kicks in much later. But the important thing is that if I have fewer firms, what happens is I have less reallocation of labor. And I'm going to show you why that is. This is how I come to these macroeconomic consequences. The macroeconomic consequences are now basically in this economy, what are the equilibrium outcomes of this economy basically uh, in, in the labor market. And the first one has to do with the decline in labor dynamism. Let me give you an explanation or, or an attempt to explain what exactly is going on in terms of the dynamism. If I have a firm that's competitively pricing, so basically it's pricing along the uh, demand curve, then if it has shocks to its costs, basically its productivity, what happens is as it moves between these productivity uh, levels, it passes everything on to the customer because it's in a competitive market. And basically, the price is going to reflect the marginal cost. And what do I see in terms of the change in the inputs? The inputs vary along the demand curve. What happens to a firm that has market power? A firm that has market power basically has a residual demand curve that's much steeper, okay? and that's interior. So that residual demand curve is basically going to give rise to, well, a different adjustment process. The same shocks are going to lead to less pass-through in terms of the prices, but more importantly for us, it also has less, less pass-through in terms of the inputs, right? Because you price along this steep uh, residual demand curve. And so what we see is for the same shocks, when I'm in a competitive market, I adjust my inputs a lot. When I'm in a market with market power, a firm that basically has market power, it adjusts it inputs, its inputs much less. Now, given that there's going to be more firms that are facing a market with market power, we're going to see this in the aggregate. 
Okay, and this is how we link this to the fact that you know the labor reallocation rate, which is the job creation plus job destruction over the amount of labor in a firm aggregated, the black line is basically the uh, economy-wide average is going from 34% to around 25%. This is the John Haltiwanger decline in labor dynamism. Okay? And we argue that this is driven, and I'm going to show you what the model predicts, this is driven by the rise in uh, uh, market power, at least by a sufficiently large number of firms. The second is wage stagnation. Well, this is just an aggregate effect. What I showed you before was at the firm level, wage stagnation is just aggregate labor demand. When I have changes in the distribution of markups, because the technology has changed, what I'm going to see is I'm going to see shifts in the labor demand. Okay, a firm that has high markups raises its price, lowers the quantity that it produces because it moves up the demand curve and therefore it lowers the quantity of inputs that it demands. And this is aggregate effects if there's enough firms that are lowering their uh, demand for inputs. Okay? And so we're going to see a wage effect and also an effect on the labor supply, the equilibrium labor supply. Notice that this is driven by an equilibrium effect. Okay? Markets for inputs are competitive. It's just the general equilibrium effect through the fact that output markets are not competitive. Okay? It's not driven by oligopsony power. It's not you know, a large firm coming to town and say, we basically extract rents from the workers. The markets are competitive in the inputs, but it has a general equilibrium effect. And then the third macro implication is the decline in the labor share. So the average has gone down from 65% to 58% as a share of GDP. There's a lot of literature proposing explanations. And one of the explanations that we would like to add to this is to say, look at what happens at the firm level. Okay? I haven't told you exactly how we derive markups, but it's basically from the first order condition of the firm's cost minimization decision. Okay? And if you, you can do that for any variable input, and let's say labor is a variable input, then this would be a rewriting of the first order condition. You can write the labor share of sales as the elasticity of labor, the output elasticity of labor, divided by the markup of the firm. Okay, this is going a bit fast, but it's just three lines of algebra from the first order condition. What this says is, in fact, we estimate that the elasticity is fairly constant over uh, from 1955 to 2016, but we see that for firms that there is a rise in their markups, that they should have a lower labor share. Why? For the same reason, they demand less inputs because they have higher prices, so they move up their demand uh, uh, for, for, for uh, the good that they sell, and as a result, they need to produce less. Therefore, higher sales, less inputs, this thing is going to go down. Now, this is at the individual firm level, okay? And if you look at the regression of the labor share on markups at the individual firm level, we see that this is consistently negative. That is, firms with higher markups are going to have a lower labor share. Now, if I tell you that in the economy the distribution of markups has changed, then you are not going to be surprised that if I'm going to aggregate this, there's enough firms that see an increase in their markups, that this is going to lead to an increase in the aggregate labor share sorry, a, a, a decrease in the aggregate labor share because there's enough firms for which the individual labor share has decreased. Here are the non-targeted moments from the estimation that uh, we have proposed. So basically, we're not targeting wages, the uh, amount of employment and labor share or the startup rate. And what we see is we kind of not exactly, but we are uh, uh, doing pretty well, I believe, in terms of matching these non-targeted moments. So we see that the model, as in the data, predicts a decline in the real wage. We predict a decline in the labor force participation and also in the labor share, and also in the startup rate, which we measure basically by firms deciding or not to enter into this market. And you can imagine that with this change in the technology, the startup rate is going to decline because we have seen an increase in uh, uh, the fixed cost and we have seen a decline in the uh, market structure. Now, you could say there's alternative models and, you know, we propose one. Maybe you want a model with identical firms rather than have firm heterogeneity. But I don't think it's going to capture one important thing that we see here in the data, which is this huge reallocation. Okay, what we see in the data is two-thirds of the rise in the sales-weighted markup is coming from reallocation from low-market firms to high-market firms. If you have a representative firm model, you cannot capture that. You could have a model with dynamic adjustment costs. 
Okay, and that would be an alternative explanation. If the cost of adjustment go up, what happens is that you know, you're going to have less reallocation, and that may give market power to firms. What is harder there is you know, how do you generate positive profits? Because one of the things that we see in the data is that profits have gone up. If your costs are going to be so much higher, this is going to eat up some of those profits. This is the Mortensen lecture. And you might say this has no relation whatsoever to what uh, Dale has done. I would like to disagree because the reason why I started to think about markups is actually uh, driven by s the first paper that I ever re read about sorting, which uh, was a paper by Dale. It's a not so well-known uh, paper because it's in a sociology journal. And it's the first paper that I know of that actually uses sorting with frictions and without frictions as applied to the labor market. And, and Dale describes very well what's going on there. And it, it, to me, it was uh, very inspiring. And Dale himself was very inspiring. And I found it uh, uh, inspiring enough to spend at least 20 years uh, doing this. Now, why do I mention this? Because the reason why I started to think uh, with my co-authors about the role of uh, markups is because we started to think about the effect of market power on sorting. You know, in a model like the one that Dale proposes, what happens if I have in the output market you know, market power, this creates distortions, and therefore the sorting patterns within firms is changing. And we show that this has big effects on the patterns of sorting, not only, but also on wages. Okay? And I think the way forward of looking at uh, the role of markups and market power is to think of how this is going to affect really uh, the wage distribution and how market power is going to affect basically the sorting of heterogeneous workers uh, within firms. We have none of that in the model that I have uh, shown you, but I believe that this is something really that can help us potentially understand what uh, is going on, why we see, for example, an increase in inequality being driven mainly by between firm inequality and not so much by uh, within firm inequality. Good. Let me conclude. So... I've shown you a number of facts. I've summarized a number of facts. I think the main conclusion I would like to stress here is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the distribution of markups and that that heterogeneity is changing over time. Okay. The markups magnitude is also very different whether you look at markups versus profits and whether you weigh with inputs or with outputs. So the increase could be 20 points if you weigh with inputs. It could be 40 points if you weigh with outputs. And the profit rate showing a 7 or 8% percentage point increase looks very different. And I've seen many people say, you know, how can these things be reconciled? I hope I've been able to convince you that there's a direct relationship between this profit rate increase and the markup rate, uh, markup uh, increase. When we think about explaining what's going on, what are the causes, we need basically both, when we estimate this model, the technology to be uh, uh, changing, in particular the fixed cost, and we also need the market structure to change. The fixed cost is important because we need to get enough market dispersion through the change in the fixed cost. And we need the market structure because otherwise we don't get the decline in the labor reallocation. Okay, so if this is something that we think is importantly going on in the labor market, we really need these two things to be at work at the same time. So I think there's both a little bit of the Amazon paradox going on and the ABM Bev mergers waves that are generating uh, market power. The net effect gives us a welfare loss. Okay? Ex ante, it could have been a welfare gain because there's selection and there's reallocation that could have positive effects on welfare. But we find when we estimate this that the welfare effect is negative and quite substantial. Now, the consequences, you know, I argue that within this general equilibrium framework, there's a number of secular trends that basically allow us to um, understand these trends as a result of this change in this technology and this market structure. And I told you, we, we find that we have a decline in this uh, business dynamism, which is re really driven by the, the, the change in the uh, pass-through, that we have incomplete pass-through. If firms are more competitive, they basically pass on shocks less to a lesser extent uh, than if they're, uh, if they're less competitive than if they're more competitive. The wage stagnation implication is coming from a general equilibrium effect. It's not coming from oligopsony, it's coming from general equilibrium because there's enough firms that decrease their demand for labor and this is obviously going to have an effect on wages. The labor that share decline is an immediate consequence of the first order condition in our model that firms with higher markups are going to have basically lower labor shares and of course if there's enough firms that have higher markups we're going to see that in the aggregate. 
And finally, there's this reallocation of sales towards high markup large firms, these super, superstar firm uh, phenomenon, in the sense that we see that it's important, and it's about two-thirds of the rise of this average markup, is coming not from the change in the markups itself, but it's coming from the change in what share of sales do high markup firms have as opposed to low markup firms. I'm sure there's many things, many questions you have, many uh, things that I've said that you uh, uh, are not ready to believe. I hope there's one thing I can convince you of. That is that, you know, we cannot really think of market power in a representative agent model. You're going to lose two-thirds of this increase in the market. You're going to lose this whole superstar effect. You're going to lose this whole reallocation. Okay? I looked at the program of... Um, um, the, the, the conference, there's 507 papers, I skimmed through them. Most of the papers actually have heterogeneous agents, okay? whether it's firms, whether it's workers, whether it's households. So this is the Society for Economic Dynamics, but it's to, in 2019, it's probably also the Society for Heterogeneous Agents Economics. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions for Jan. Okay. I'll give you mine. So one thing I, I didn't hear you talk at all about is risk. And if I thought about why do I think a firm might set a price that's higher than our cost, I'd think, well, um, you know, starting a new product line is, is uncertain. I don't know what the revenues will be. And if I don't think I'm going to get some margin, I'm not going to get any return for risk. So I guess my question is, do we, do we think that market power is necessarily not competitive, or do we think that it might be return for risk taking? I think it's a very good point, and it's, it's something that we haven't really worked enough on to, to, to nail that. We've thought a little bit about it. Um, we've leaned a little bit on the results that uh, Haltewanger has been proposing, is that they, at least in, in, in the volatility of uh, TFPR, that that hasn't gone up much. What they see is that the response, you know, in terms of the inputs, that's why they see the decline in business dynamism has declined. Now, of course, is TFPR a good measure of, of, of risk because it's a capital investment? And, and that's why I say we haven't really done the, the, the work. You know, it's, it's an open question. It could be that it's just an enormous rise in, in, in risk and that is, you know, leads firms to demand for a higher, basically, return by setting higher prices. Now, it must be enormous because we see, basically, the profit rates moving, going up sevenfold or eightfold. As a, a share of sales, so it, it's going to have to be an enormous rise in profits. And at least, if you believe that the FPR volatility is some measure of risk, you may disagree, and I, I'm not sure that it is a good measure. That that hasn't go, uh, uh, gone up, so we would have to find really has that risk substantially increased. But I think it's a very good question. Sure. So I kind of like at the beginning this decomposition, like this, uh, so the within versus between. And I wonder, so I think the message was that a lot happens by reallocation to firms that actually don't really change their markup. Um, but I didn't really get whether the model that you have laid out so far, could that say something about that? Did you try yes. to think about fixing? Yes, we, we, we basically, I didn't show you the, uh, in the, the, the graph, but we can reproduce the decomposition of uh, basically these, exactly that, that uh, within, between and, and net entry, okay? And so we get, we get very similar magnitudes. We get not two thirds, we get just above 50%, so we don't get as much reallocation as we see in the data, but we get that reallocation is an important, or the most important driver uh, of this. So can you explain again, you know, kind of you have this composition with the uh, welfare, I guess when you compare the two, so you have like, you know, kind of two, let's say two years, I mean, two, two times, and then you have kind of different effects. One was markup, the other one was, I think you call it um, reallocation. reallocation, let's say forget about the one that is kind of zero, and then there's L, 
And so in particular, these are things that I didn't understand. You didn't really have time to explain it. But anyway, if you could explain it. Imagine like, you know, so if labor supply will be um, exogenously fixed, then one thing that any change will do is that just you mess up the allocation across goods. Yes. You know, some goods, uh, beer is too expensive, and Coke, good for me, is kind of uh, cheap. But that's really nothing to do with labor supply. So then there's something about, you know, kind of, there's that effect. That's the other effect is that somehow by messing up with the, with the allocation, the ideal price index is kind of worse, and then this has an effect on kind of real wages. And that's why you, that seems to be different from the logic you're saying about demand, so if you could explain it. And the other thing is that if you have a higher cost, which is a higher fee, how can this could be good? I understand that, you know, it changes who enters and who doesn't, but it's sort of like a lower, at a very basic level, it's a worse technology. So if you could explain, I mean, you didn't have time to set up the model, but maybe you could set it up and explain this, you know, what do you mean by this? <laughs> okay, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, I'll, it's, it's, so, I, I mean, Clearly, if, 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 if you have uh, inelastic labor supply, you're not going to have the effect of, of labor. Okay? Uh, the way we do it here, the labor supply is recalibrated to what people find as a kind of a review article by Chetty, but it's mainly the paper by uh, Blundell and co-authors. We have an elasticity of 25%, and that's what's giving us uh, uh, the, the change in labor supply. The effect on wages is big that we get, the equilibrium effect. And the reason why the equilibrium effect is so big is because there's basically a huge demand, uh, sorry, change in the demand uh, for, for labor. Okay, so 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 that's why we get that that uh, 10 percent, a point 10 um, uh, log points decrease in uh, due to the, the labor. The reallocation is is the one you say. Well, the fixed costs go up. How can this be good? There's a trade-off. Okay, because you know fewer firms. And and to me, I didn't know this before starting to work on this, but. If, if you think about, you, we don't change the distribution. The distribution, well, we allow for the change, but let's keep the distribution fixed for now. As I increase the, the fixed cost, you know, only the best firms enter. And more is being produced by the best firms, because if I have a low fixed cost, there's also all these bad firms that are producing. This is not so good for productivity. Okay, if you have a lot of bad firms entering into the market, and so it happens to be the case that the fixed cost, which is negative, is offset by the fact that now only this reallocation effect is so large. And this is what we find, that we really have these high productivity firms that are now taking a much larger share of what's being produced. And that's the biggest effect of uh, uh, this decomposition, that is the positive effect. Now it turns out that how do we calculate the effect in this decomposition of the increase in the markups? We just take the average markup as if there's no change in the distribution. Okay, and if I increase the markup for everyone, that generates that weight loss. And that's, of course, also strictly negative. There's no ambiguity there. Okay? And these two are more or less of the same magnitude. Okay? For a different estimation, it's going to be a different, uh, uh, um, it's going to have different values. But we find that this selection effect, despite that there's a higher cost, okay, the selection effect or this reallocation effect is dominating. I'm not sure that I haven't explained enough, but let, let's sit next to each other at dinner and we can, go, we can do some more. So, uh, so I think that uh, you showed in your graph that you, you had a, like a 25% decline in the real wage, and you said this was matching the data. So I, I didn't know that wages had declined 25%. This, this is as a share of GDP. So if you, you know, wages, basically what, what we're doing is we, we, we say wage, because in our economy there's no growth, right? And so between 1980 and 2016, we've had growth of, I think it's 80%. I'm just saying from the top of my head. And so it's basically as a result of the fact that, you know, real wages have basically stagnated, but GDP has gone so up. Re so relative to productivity, you mean? Yes. Yeah. So, and then my second question is, I, I would think that there would be, similar to an effect on the labor supply, there would be effects through lower capital in the sense that there's an additional wedge between now, you know, the marginal product of capital and the rental rate. And would that affect welfare? I mean, we don't have capital here, so, and there's not much I can say about it because we don't have it in the model. Um, the only thing that's getting a little bit close, 
if you want, you don't have to want to, but um, that is a little bit close to capitalist, this, this fixed cost. You could interpret this as some, some notion of capital, but not like you're saying, you know, ideally we would like to have a model with both capital and labor, and we would like to basically analyze the same effect that we have on, on labor that is happening, happening on, on, on capital. I'm sympathetic with you that this should have a similar uh, uh, effect, but again, it's not in the model, so. So if there are such big welfare losses, what should we do? What's the policy implication? Huh. Um, because of this big reallocation, you know, I'm, I'm talking out of the model here, so, you know, it's a, how much... Let, let's believe the model for the 20 seconds that I respond. Um, because there's such an important reallocation, it's definitely not splitting up this high-productivity firm. Because if you have this high productivity firm, you, you know, it depends what it, it means splitting up, right? But if it were the case that, you know, the, supposedly we interpret this positive reallocation effect that Amazon uh, might, might have is the result of this large firm, okay, that is dominant, then, you know, suppose we completely lose that productivity if we split it up in two firms. Okay. Of course, if you can maintain these two firms both being equally productive, that would be great. But if there's some loss, and I believe if you think of the network externalities that Amazon might have from this huge distribution network that it has, um, if we lose productivity there, then splitting up is going to be actually worse. Now, there's again the trade-off because you know, if you have split them up, you have now two firms that compete against each other, the debt weight loss is also going to change because you have more competition, right? What is more uh, transparent in my view is that at least in our model, what happens with this market structure? Probably InBev shouldn't have bought Anheuser-Busch and probably Facebook shouldn't have bought WhatsApp and, uh, and Instagram because what we find here is that the effect is unambiguously negative because you don't have that positive reallocation effect that you have with the productivity change. So I would make a distinction between the technological change that generates positive productivity effects, and unfortunately also dead weight loss, and the pure market structure change that generates negative dead weight loss only. One last question, maybe. Very really lecture, I really enjoyed it. Uh, quick question on, uh, you had a bunch of uh, facts to test, uh, but one thing was missing was stock markets or financial markets. So I think uh, Emmanuel is giving the plenary tomorrow, has some work is showing that if markup went up really that much, you should see stock market booming way more than, than, uh, than, than it is now. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, I haven't shown you this. We, we look at that. Um, the way we look at this, if we look at the, the, the stock market valuation is as, as a share of sales because we want to normalize this. If, if I would take the S&P 500, because these firms have become bigger, the S&P 500 value becomes bigger because it's 500 firms. It's not normalized to sales or something like that. So when we, uh, I mean, of course, the S&P 500 has gone up proportionally to the increase in, in, in markups. If you actually look at the evolution of the S&P 500 before 1980, uh, it's much less, uh, it's increasing much uh, less than it is after uh, 1980. But mainly doing this as a share of sales, we see a very strong correlation. Okay, and it's, I think, as you would expect, because if your profits go up, your dividend goes up, and what is uh, the market value? It's basically mainly a discounted stream of dividends, risk, and many other things, but the discounted stream of dividends is going to be an important. And we find that this is, the, that the, the, uh, this is an important uh, positive correlation between these two. Okay, please join me in thanking Jan for his interesting Thank lecture. You.